the Master of Dance Studies in the Center for College of Students and their capstone project, which we'll hear about shortly. Less than a year ago, the CSP students were given the challenge of creating a product targeted at a specific audience that used climate science to impact some aspect of climate policy. Moreover, they were asked to make it something that would be used, incorporated in a broader effort, and have a specific outcome. As you all the students rose to this challenge, and you will hear the extent to which their projects have, in many cases, already been useful, useful in affecting policy, um, and that's already evident in a number of cases. In making these achievements, these students have demonstrated their potential, working to the best of their abilities, and in some cases, outcompeting many of their peers across scripts. I cannot tell you how proud and impressed I am in their efforts and learning new things, stretching their talents, and reaching out to society in an amazingly creative number of ways. Um, as I think I just saw him walk in. Um, I also want to announce we have a special visitor here today, Dr. Corey Gabriel, who will be around at break and at the party and would love to meet both students and faculty and other interested members of the CSP community. He is an expert in climate science, um, has a PhD looking at the climate engineering impacts and policy implications, and also just in his spare time, a degree in law and is a biology minor. And, um, and so um, really impressive, and he's also applying to be the um, next assistant director of the CSP program. So, um, take the opportunity to get to meet him if you can. Um, I also want to note the important contributions of the expert advisors, many of whom are here today, um, for all these projects, because these projects really were um, helped along um, both by local and remote advisors, and this program, me in particular, was a huge thank you to all the faculty and scientists who have helped these students reach their goals. So. A quick thank you to them from me and CSP staff. <laughs> now, finally, with that, I present to you the CSP class of 2017 and our first speaker is Todd Brooks. <laughs> Thanks for that, Lynn, and thank you everyone for coming today. My name is Paula Spuda, and I'm going to be presenting my master's capstone project that looks at how climate change is impacting cultural heritage in Puerto Rico. I'll begin by providing some background on Puerto Rico and then go into a discussion of how different climate parameters are affecting material heritage and along with a case study on the sea level rise vulnerability of coastal sites. And I'll end with a discussion on some adaptive strategies that cultural heritage managers can utilize to address these issues. So what is cultural heritage? Cultural heritage can be intangible in the form of myths, stories, traditions, and cultural practices. Or it can also be tangible material heritage, such as archaeological sites, historic buildings and monuments, or cultural landscapes. Heritage plays an important role in shaping people's identity by evoking in them a sense of place and belonging. It is what connects people with their community, home, and with their past. A little louder. Yes. Climate change threatens to damage and destroy cultural heritage through direct harm to specific sites and through forced, forced migration of severely impacted regions. My research looks specifically at how climate change generally is impacting material heritage in Puerto Rico, along with a case study on the threat of sea level rise to Puerto Rico's coastal heritage. Island of approximately 9,000 square kilometers, with a population between the Atlantic and the Caribbean, and it is just north of the intertropical convergence zone. Though it has a tropical climate, Puerto Rico does experience cooler temperatures along the interior Cordillera Central a zone of higher elevation, which can be seen in the blue region on this map. Puerto Rico has a long and rich cultural history that is apparent throughout the island, in part through its iconic cultural heritage, such as the Castillo del Morro, a 16th century citadel that is now a heritage site. Puerto Rico's heritage is really important to local communities, as I mentioned earlier, but it also has important economic value for the island which earned $3.4 million, sorry, $3.4 billion in international tourism in 2015. Climate change poses a serious threat to Puerto Rico, its tourism sector, and its archaeological assets. These threats come from various climate parameters, including air temperature, precipitation, erosion, storms and hurricanes, ocean acidification, 
sea surface temperatures, and sea level rise, which I will discuss next. Since the 1950s, Puerto Rico has seen an overall increase in annual mean air temperature, a pattern which is expected to continue in step with global projections along with increasing extreme temperatures. This will impact archaeological materials by accelerating the deterioration rates of recently exposed artifacts and decay rates of organic materials. Additionally, extreme heat can cause, a, can cause sudden thermal expansion, which can crack materials such as the pipes of historic buildings. Now moving on to rainfall, which in Puerto Rico varies regionally. This means that effects from climate change will not necessarily be uniform across the island. Seasonal rain trends are expected to intensify with wetter winters and drier summers. Sites in areas receiving less rainfall will experience heat cracking of dry soils, causing a loss of stratigraphic integrity. That is the preservation, the preservation of layering of sediments, and which is very important for interpreting the age of artifacts. On the other hand, sites in, in, in areas receiving some more rainfall will have higher relative humidity, which increases the occurrence of corrosion, mold, and decay of organic materials. Additionally, Puerto Rico has experienced 37% increase in very heavy rainfall, a trend that is projected to continue into the future. This does not mean more rain generally, but rather an increase in the intensity of individual rain events. These large quantities of rain falling in short periods leads to potential flooding, which will cause direct physical damage to material and can also create new flood channels that weaken structures and increase the chance of collapse. Intense, intense rainfall can also exacerbate erosion rates. Erosion is very difficult to predict and there can be sudden and drastic erosion occurring over a short period of time. So it, it makes it a particularly severe threat to heritage sites, which can lose structural stability and incur extensive damage. Erosion can also expose previously buried materials, which are then at risk from wind and wave action, as well as from looting. The consequence of many weather events, including tropical storms and hurricanes. Increasing intense storms and hurricanes can, can cause strong storm surges. This increases erosion of coastal sites, as I mentioned, and also destabilizes underwater sites. Strong winds from storms can directly damage materials and also lead to secondary damage from wind-blown debris. Moving on to oceanic impacts, Puerto Rico reflects global and regional trends in ocean acidification rates, and these patterns are projected to continue with continued emissions of carbon dioxide. Underwater, ocean acidification leads to corrosion of metal in underwater sites. And along the coast, it degrades sites with stonework made of materials such as limestone or mortar. In addition to ocean acidification, sea surface temperatures are also changing in Puerto Rico, which is experiencing faster warming on the Caribbean coast and on the Atlantic coast. Projections for the next 50 years show sea surface temperatures above the threshold for coral bleaching for approximately one third of the year, while the threshold for deep, deep convection storm formation can be exceeded all year round. Consequences of this warming include accelerated rusting of water, underwater and tidal zone cultural resources. Lastly, sea level rise has become an increasing concern in many parts of the world due to the number of small island nations under threat, as well as the disproportionate concentration of populations living in coastal regions. Due to this historically high population of coastal populations, there exists a lot of coastal cultural heritage. I performed a case study to assess the vulnerability of coastal sites to sea level rise in Puerto Rico. Historical records show a sea level rise rate of 1.7 millimeters per year since 1900. However, recent satellite data starting in 1992 shows an almost doubling of this rate to 3.2 millimeters per year. Sea level rise in Puerto Rico has been consistent with these global trends. These increasing rates of sea level rise, along with new information about the potential for rapid ice melt in Greenland and the Antarctic, has led NOAA to recommend upper updating upper bound estimates of sea level rise for the end of century from 1.8 meters to 2.5 meters. These rising seas will form a new intertidal zone, which exposes once dry areas to periodic wetting and drying, increasing the rates of degradation of buried materials. Sea level rise can also lead to the permanent flooding or submergence of coastal sites. The intrusion of saltwater into soil and the heightening of the water table will increase corrosion, rusting, and rot of sites and buried artifacts, as well as causing stratigraphic damage. To assess the vulnerability of individual sites, to these threats, I used archaeological data provided by the Puerto Rican Institute of Culture. This data set contains all known cultural heritage sites that lie below 20 meters in elevation and was combined with sea level rise data from NOAA, who provide projections of sea level rise from 0 to 1.8 meters. I analyzed this data to assess which sites are at greatest risk of inundation and map the results using ESRI's ArcGIS software. 
The archaeological data shows that there are a total of 1,185 known archaeological cultural heritage sites in Puerto Rico that lie below 20 meters in elevation. This, these sites break down into either indigenous, historic, or multi-component. Sea level rise values from 0 to 1.8 meters and increments of 0.3 meters represent projected values from present day to the end of the century. These values were mapped along with points of individual sites to determine which sites are at risk of inundation. As you can see, there are specific regions at greater risk than others, and I chose four regions to focus in on. They are Cabo Rojo, San Juan, Loisa, and the southern region of Vieques Island. The island of Vieques is projected to have a total of 33 affected sites, particularly in and across its southern coast. The northeast region of Puerto Rico from San Juan to Fajardo shows a total of 49 impacted sites, while the southwest region of Puerto Rico around Cabo Rojo has a total of sites. This table here shows how many and what type of sites will be inundated by mid-century and by 2100. It should be noted that there are presently 27 sites that are already inundated at today's highest high tide line. And when assuming a 0.6 meter rise in sea level by 2050, 56 sites will become inundated at the highest high tide. This value more than doubles to 140 sites by 2100 when assuming a 1.8 rise in sea level. I have also highlighted here at the bottom the number of sites that showed up beyond but within one meter of the high tide line. There are three reasons these sites should also be considered as very vulnerable. First, as I mentioned earlier, upper bound projections by the end of century are as high as 2.5 meters, while this analysis only extended to 1.8 meters. So it is very possible that these additional sites could also see an inundation effect. Second, the archaeological data used in the study was point data, but in reality, these sites are multidimensional and expand beyond the point on the map in all directions. So proportion, portions of these sites are not counted and they could still experience inundation. And lastly, even if not a direct risk of inundation, the close proximity to the high tide line makes these sites more vulnerable to other impacts like storm surges and erosion. So the obvious question after viewing these results is what can be done to adapt to protect these numerous heritage sites? And the truth is that providing adequate adaptive management to thousands of sites with numerous and unique vulnerabilities is a very challenging task. This research on specific impacts and vulnerabilities is a critical first step in eventually forming adaptation strategies for these sites. Cultural heritage managers need tools and guidance to help them address climate change into site-specific management plans. Several strategies already exist to help cultural heritage managers, and I will briefly discuss three examples of this that I feel exemplify the most important aspects of adaptation strategies. In 2007, UNESCO released a report on climate change and world heritage, which was created in order for state parties to implement appropriate management of world heritage sites in response to climate change. Though written, or, though written for world heritage sites, this report does provide useful information about local level aspects of designing management plan, and it is therefore very relevant to the management of any cultural heritage site. Another strategy that comes from the National Park Service's 2016 Cultural Resources and Climate Change Strategy which highlights that management decisions should prioritize cultural heritage based on its vulnerability and its significance. They also recognize the potential for total loss of sites and the importance of monitoring and record keeping. I'm, I'm not sure what's happening. I'm sorry, I apologize. There we go, I'll just keep going. <laughs> um, both reports emphasize local, national, and international collaboration to learn from and share transferable tools and techniques. Lastly, the SCAPE Trust, which stands for Scottish Coastal Archaeology and the Problem of Erosion, has created a model for prioritizing sites based on their vulnerability. The model collects physical data on the parameter in question, such as erosion, or in this case, sea level rise, and, sorry, and combines the data with geographic data of cultural heritage sites to assess which sites are most vulnerable. And there is currently an international team in Puerto Rico of archaeologists working to implement this model. SCAPE has now expanded into the Scottish Heritage at Risk Program, or SHARP, which uses citizen science to monitor at-risk sites. So local community members visiting sites can use a smartphone app that allows them to provide updates on these sites. This improves site records while instilling a sense of ownership and stewardship in local communities. SHARP also uses ShoreDig, a project that works to consider the value and meaning that at-risk cultural heritage has to local communities and alters preservation priorities based on community input and concerns. Puerto Rico cultural heritage managers can utilize these existing tools and strategies to aid them in creating management plans 
that adapt to a changing climate. In order, to have, in order to have successful adaptation strategies, there needs to be communication between different cultural heritage managers to share tools and lessons about climate adaptation in order to increase the resilience of management plans across the board. And I want to end by pointing out two important messages that I learned throughout my research. First, cultural heritage is not just something that is at risk from climate change. It also provides, an, it also plays an important role in the mitigation of climate change. Environmental archaeologists study past societies that provide useful information about how they adapted to and altered a changing natural environment. Knowledge of what has taken place in the past improves present day decisions about development and adaptation. And second, cultural heritage also strengthens an individual's identity within a specific place. And that attachment means that they will care more and work harder to preserve that place. This is a major reason why engaging communities in public archaeology is a crucial step in climate adaptation. This assessment was done as part, of the, as part of the Puerto Rico Climate Change Council's upcoming 2017 report on society and economy, and it was presented at their eighth summit this year. The Puerto Rico Climate Change Council has already utilized some of these results to provide comments for the fourth national climate assessment of the U.S. Global Change Research Program. There have also been other attempts for dissemination of these works, such as presenting at the 82nd annual meeting of the Society for American Archaeology, both at the Presidential Forum on Climate Change and Archaeology, as well as the Burning Library Symposium, hosted by the Society's Committee on Climate Change. And I'd like to take a minute to thank the women on my advisory committee, Dr. Lynn Russell and Ali Farahani, who have both dedicated an admirable amount of time into this program, Heidi Basher for helping me immensely on all things GIS related, and lastly, Dr. Isabel Rivera Collazo for her enthusiasm towards me and towards this project. Isabel has taught me about new aspects of climate change that I had never before considered and truly expanded my view of its impact on society. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Questions to down. No, no, no. Jane. But when I was at the um, conference of Society for American Archaeology um, at the symposium, there was a lot of really interesting groups uh, doing similar work in just everywhere, like in the U.S., in Florida, in Scotland, um, and in Puerto Rico. Um, but I personally didn't do this uh, research in any other region. Yeah, I mean, I found uh, that the the Burning Library Symposium was really that, it was a place for all these people doing this research to sort of share with each other what has worked, what hasn't worked. So um, my advisor, Isabel, works very closely with Tom Dawson, who is the founder of the SCAPE program, and he's working with her to implement SCAPE um, in Puerto Rico with other climate parameters. Yeah. Corey. You brought up a couple different ways that climate is changing Puerto Rico and how those changes might affect cultural heritage across the island. Sea level rise, both the gradual sea level rise and talked about extreme event frequency, like 30 to 37 percent or 37, yeah. Yeah. And you talked about um, also thermal expansion and temperature increasing. You talked about changing the seasonal cycle of this state. There's a lot going on. Yeah. Of all of those factors, is there one that stands out that you think we could work toward adapting to that's really important and actually um, address protecting this cultural heritage? Is there, is there one of those factors you think is most important that you think? Well, yeah, I think that um, I think that erosion is, I'm not sure how easy it is to address it, but I think it's very important to address it because I think it can cause the most damage in such a short amount of time because it's not something we can sort of project into the future. Um, and obviously sea level rise, which is one of the reasons why I focused in on it. But that's sort of just assessing what are the most, I guess, threatening climate parameters as yeah. far as what would be the easiest to address. Um, I, I actually don't know. I, I think it really depends. I haven't, I wasn't able to do a lot of research on specific adaptations. So like, um, I know that a lot of times just. No, there's probably not one specific right answer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I would say that like basically assessing the, which sites, which specific sites are most vulnerable to address those first. So like, because mm -hmm. there's a thousand sites, those 27 that I found are already at risk of inundation. Yeah. It would be providing that information to the 
Purdue Youth Institute of Culture so they can address those sites first and go to those first and assess what's, you know, what they can do there. That's a good question. Um, I'm not on fellow, so I, I don't know what what you know Isabel might say. Um, I don't think so though, because I think that there there is I, something that I also learned throughout this year that I hadn't thought about before is like storage. If it exposes these sites and you want to preserve them, you're probably gonna have to excavate. And there's not always like places to put all of these things, right? You have to have storage space and, and a museum collection or a plate. And that's actually a very complicated subject within archaeology that I hadn't really thought about before. Just sometimes preserving them where they are is not necessarily a bad thing. Judith? Not in Puerto Rico that I know of personally. I know that um, on like a larger global scale, I have heard that certain small island nations are already looking to pay in Puerto Rico that I know of. I, I don't know of any like severe relocation of coastal communities yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we are in the process of beginning to decide what to do with communities that are being facing erosion that, that erosion is actually affecting their home. There have been some houses that needed to be abandoned, um, but it's not a concerted intervention with communities uh, to, to have them relocate forcibly. Uh, some people have had to leave their houses or try to do something else to put fences in other places or things like that, but we still have not had to relocate communities. We are facing some scale of flooding, some uh, significant effect of erosion, both erosion, but the relocation of communities. We are facing issues with cultural heritage that is being negatively affected. Uh, and Paula's research is the first step to, to decide what to do with this process. Great, thank you. Thank you. And now our next speaker is Zach Menz. So, hello everyone, my name is Zachary Menzo and today I'm going to talk about an oversight in earth system models and the resulting analyses known as marine feedbacks. One of the greatest challenges facing the next generation of decision makers is how to handle the changing climate. For most, their understanding of the climate system can be summarized by a few buzzwords they hear such as CO2 or rising sea levels. It is because of this lack of understanding that new decision makers and bureaucrats must rely on the data provided by Earth system models and the resulting climate analyses. Unfortunately, most of these models are often incomplete, as many of the climate's functions are too complicated or poorly understood to recreate. Now for most, this is not a significant problem, as their influence on the climate is relatively limited. However, scientists have recently begun to warn about the underrepresentation of features known as marine biogeochemical feedbacks, which I will now refer to as marine feedbacks. These experts are, experts are finding that some of the marine feedbacks may accelerate global warming, while others may actually have a cooling effect. And their exclusion from Earth system models means the impact they have on the climate are not represented in the resulting analyses, causing the results to be statistically biased. Now, since there is no one policy which can resolve this problem, a new method is needed to present this oversight to the political community. To accomplish this, for my capstone project, I've created a free and interactive website which represents two of these marine feedbacks and the role within the climate system. The descriptions were created for non-scientists explaining the complicated concepts behind marine feedbacks through simple explanations, images, and examples. After its initial publication, the website will serve as a living document, 
which means it, be, it can be continually developed to include additional feedback and future results. The project will target future decision makers and bureaucrats as they are still in an educational stage of their careers. The audience was chosen because they are currently seeking letters of recommendation or future employment and are more willing to put in the extra effort and review new research as it may help their future careers. The first feedback presented on the site is the DMS Cloud Albedo Feedback, which is referred to as ocean plankton on the site. It is called this because there is a group of phytoplankton which can produce and release a compound known as dimethyl sulfide, or DMS. When DMS is released into the atmosphere, it undergoes a series of reactions ending with a sulfate aerosol particle. And this sulfate particle is amazing because not only can it directly reflect the sun's light, but it also acts as a seed for clouds. And since clouds play such an important role in the radiative budget of Earth, understanding the DMS cycle and how it's being affected by climate change may be of extreme importance. The second is the ice chlorophyll feedback, which is referred to as ice plankton on the site. During the beginning of the summer seasons at higher latitudes, an increase in sunlight caused the sea ice to begin its annual melting. With less ice covering the ocean surface, more of the sun's warmth is able to reach the water, causing an increase in plankton abundance in and around the ice. Each of these microbes then use the sunlight to create nutrients through photosynthesis. However, when they do this, they begin to radiate heat, further melting the ice. This process may alter the structure and stability of local food chains, weaken the ocean circulation, and may even induce the well-known ice albedo feedback leading to a catastrophic runaway effect. So when it comes to the actual design of the website, I found that the layout and format were fundamental to the overall project success. Given the complex nature of marine feedbacks and the non-scientific audience it's targeting, the information needed to be presented in a clear and concise manner. To do this, uh, nearly every page included images or videos to keep the content engaging while helping with the explanations. Also, scientific terms like thermohaline circulation were replaced with more accessible terms like uh, Earth's circulatory system. The primary reference when we used when designing this website was Facebook. The social media site was chosen as more than half the target audience was reported to have an account and checking it daily. The simple clean layout provides users with the ease of navigation and nearly universal approval. This arrangement, along with the color schemes, link format, and curved box framing were all adapted while constructing the site. Finally, after speaking with a few individuals from the target audience, I decided to keep the descriptions as succinct as possible, only including the most relevant information in bullet form, while providing links with additional details for users who are curious or require further explanations. From the introduction page, which is shown here, the first few pages displayed in the menu are entitled Background. These pages in the section include three topics which may be necessary information for some users before they learn about the marine feedbacks. These pages are presented with limited information as there are already numerous online resources to learn about these topics in greater detail. The first page relies heavily on videos, which includes an introduction narrated by Bill Nye, an excellent visual representation of the greenhouse gas effect, and a demonstration of the expected economic impacts from a two degrees centigrade warning. In addition to the videos, I have also provided a short written description attempting to tie together all three videos and the overall concept. The next topic begins with a brief video explaining what natural feedbacks are while demonstrating their importance. Once the video concludes, the users are provided with a brief description of various types of feedbacks, including negative, positive, and marine. Now in this context, a feedback is a sequence of events which either reduces or amplifies a change to the climate. A negative feedback balances changes to the climate. For example, if the planet's temperature increases, a negative feedback will respond with a decrease in temperature, stabilizing the climate. On the other hand, a positive feedback enhances the changes. For example, if the planet's temperature increases, a positive feedback would lead to a further warming, we're starting the process over. And finally, feedbacks are associated with the actions of plankton living along the ocean surface. Although there is currently limited uh, information, lim excuse me, limited information provided with these processes, some results suggest they may significantly influence the global temperature. The following subject focuses on the development of climate analyses and the way they may inf be influenced by assumption or omissions. 
Page claims the need for well-informed policies to address climate change, stating that this may be accomplished by teaching decision makers about how their analyses are produced. Next, we're gonna focus on the marine feedback section. And as you will notice, the pages within the section are all represented using a format to ensure the site is easy to navigate. The first page the user will find for either of the feedbacks are the executive summaries. And the goal of these pages was to present all the pertinent information regarding that feedback onto one page. So technically, if the users only have a few moments to learn about the feedbacks, be able to read these summaries and take away the key facts. The pages begin with the science involved in each process, focused on the sequence of events which occur throughout the feedback. And they finish by listing the potential economic impacts, listing both the monetary effects with both brief and extended explanations. Since the data is still preliminary, a formal financial analysis has not been conducted, which means that only qualitative descriptions could be included at the moment. The background page, that didn't work. Um, all right. So from, from the introduction page, which is shown here, the first few pages displayed on the menu are entitled background. I already did this, excuse me. There we go. Way back, sorry about this, folks. Okay, so the background pages, which were designed to answer any questions that while not imperative to understanding the process, may arise while learning about the feedback. Like, what is DMS? Or how does, I, how does the plankton get into the sea ice? Next are the feedback steps. And they present the most important information found on the website. I use slideshows to provide in-depth descriptions about each step uh, that occurs during the feedback. The DMS feedback begins with the type of phytoplankton which produce DMS or play an important role during climate change. The slides then demonstrate the ways that DMS is released from phytoplankton, the reaction it undergoes once in the atmosphere, and both the direct and indirect effect the compound has. The ice feedback shows an image of the ice with four links, outside, top, middle, and bottom of the ice. And next to the picture is a list of possible consequences from the feedback. Since the feedback has four different reactionary pathways, I felt the most comprehensive way to present this information was to separate each reaction into its own sequence. That way the users can then click on the various locations and walk through each step. The final pages are the climate change impact for the DMS feedback and the future research for the ICE feedback. The climate change impact are described by its initiation, impact on the phytoplankton, and overall consequences. And like the other pages on this site, each impact offers more in-depth explanations. Also, three of the most important topics of future research for the ICE feedback were included. The page was added in place of the climate change impact, as there is currently no substantial information or research provided within the literature about the effects global warming may be having on this feedback. Once the website was completed, it was subjected to a series of tests and reviews before publication. First was the alpha launch. Now, throughout my project, I've worked closely with my advisor, Scott Elliott, who is considered an expert on marine feedbacks. So as a first test of the website, he reviewed each page as they were completed, ensuring the accuracy and proper presentation of the information. After the necessary revisions were made, the website was ready for its beta launch. First, it was sent to be reviewed by members of the target audience and its peers. Emails were sent to a range of groups to gain input from a variety of backgrounds. Within each email, several pages from the website were chosen to provide a representation of the descriptions and format used throughout the site. Participants were then asked to review these pages and afterward, complete a short survey to organize their thoughts and gauge their reactions. Next, the website was sent to each member of my capstone advisory committee, in addition to several colleagues at Scott Elliott's. The pages to these individuals allowed for a final check of the communication techniques, and more importantly, the quality and accuracy of information presented. The final step in the capstone project was marketing the website to the target audience. In order to do this, I used three main sources of marketing. The first were the promotional tools offered by Wix.com. Now, Wix was the platform I used to both design and launch the website. 
And the site's tools explain how to do things like add descriptions that would appear on Google, or how to search and add keywords to increase traffic from online searches. The second marketing attempt was made by purchasing advertisement rights to endorse on Facebook. After creating a simple poster for the project, which is shown here on screen, specific demographic and interest groups were selected to target who the advertisement will reach. Promotion will run on Facebook throughout the next year and is expected to be seen by 500 to 2,500 users per day. Finally, the primary method of marketing to the target audience was to contact student-run democratic organizations. Emails were sent to the top 10 universities around Washington, D.C., in addition to the top 50 political science universities across America. Each email explained the importance of the information presented in the website and the ultimate goals of the project. By fostering these relationships, several groups provided access to their established network of students and helped promote the website to their communities. Currently, Harvard, Georgetown, UCLA, UC Riverside, and the university agreed to help disseminate the website. Now that the website is complete, has been launched, and was marketed, the next step for the project is its status as a living document. The description allows for the continual development and update as more research is conducted and further data is generated. Specifically, the past few months, I've been working with Scott Elliott to include the DMS feedback into a reduced climate model, and we'll continue to work on this throughout the, throughout the coming year. If successful, the model will be able to provide data, which can then be added to the site. The status also allows for additional marine feedbacks to be included in the future. Depending on the level of traffic and attention the website gains, feedbacks may be added using a similar format as the DMS and ICE feedback. In conclusion, the project is the first step to resolve two issues within the science and policy intersection. First, it educates future decision makers about the influence marine feedbacks may have on their analyses. And second, it provides a channel for expert scientists to communicate important and complex topics while considering the limited time and scientific background most decision makers have. In the end, global warming and the production of climate analyses must be made comprehensible to bureaucrats. This website aims to be a small step towards making this possible by providing a new way to communicate the science. Ultimately, if enough people use the website, once the target audience is in a position of power, it may lead to a greater amount of legislation who accounts for these feedbacks creating policies which are better informed by the science and the climate system. Thank you very much for your attention. Does anybody have any questions? Check with the URL. Okay, it's uh, marinefeedbacks.com. Yeah, I thought the idea had to be good work really awesome, but thank you. Do you mind going back to the DMS, uh, the DMS module just for Sure. So you have it in, in, in this in this these modules and in the reduced climate model you put into you have the EMS or the claw hypothesis. As, as strictly as a negative feedback? So, no, and that's actually why DMS is so complicated. Currently, in the reduced model that we're using, which is Hector, there's already a sulfur cycle. And in that equation that they have, it accounts for both natural and anthropogenic emissions. Yeah. But how it does it is it kind of represents it all as one lump sum. And the thing with DMS is it has different impacts depending on the latitude. So, at higher latitudes, as of now, there's an expected increase in DMS. And at lower latitudes, there's an expected decrease. And so none of this is represented in the equation in the current Hector model. So that's one of the things that we're working on is trying to see if we can um, alter that equation, to try and represent the difference in latitude, and also trying to show that DMS actually has a role. Because again, if you represent DMS and sulfur dioxide, which is the two main sources of the sulfur cycle, it all says it's happening at one location. But at the lower latitudes where all the industrialized nations are, we're producing a lot of SO2, and that's the dominant factor. But again, at higher latitudes where it's all water, DMS is actually a very big source, and to show its latitudinal difference is not something we're trying to add in. So one, one suggestion I would have is that one of the, the claw hypothesis, one of the authors' original paper, wrote a book a couple years later saying it might actually go the opposite way because global warming might stratify, stratify the ocean, meaning the layers are stacked in the ocean. And so, so you get less nutrients that level where photosynthesis occurs. So less DMS released to the atmosphere, less oxidation, less sulfur dioxide, less carbon, which 
the AI, it actually makes it more. So I'm actually glad you brought that up because on the website that is addressed. Obviously, for the presentation purposes, I gave a really quick overview. Yeah. But if you go to the website, it kind of breaks down all the different impacts by latitude and all the different ones that climate change is happening and stratification, the winding because of heat, and all that kind of stuff is included on the website. In the back. So the first thing that we're doing right now is because it's actually just launching right now, but there's no real feedback to kind of go off of and see how well all the different attempts are going. Um, in the coming months, if we are able to produce some data and it is starting to generate some interest, then we may just kind of continue the way we're doing by working with these student-run demographics or just the Facebook advertisement. And if it's not working and we want to continue with this platform, we may kind of wind up our approach like Sierra Club and other kind of organizations were kind of suggested as a means once we get to a more substantial data that we can include. The best of now, it's all qualitative, which is obviously a great first step. But in my opinion, at least, this will really kind of get its roots once you have some data to provide with it. So right now, it's kind of just setting up the qualitative information, presenting it. Then we can get some data added to it, and then it can be kind of a full-fledged project that you can really kind of give to not just student-run organizations, but people that can currently do something about it. Yeah, and again, it's going to kind of all depend on how well this actually goes, and that's going to be tracking analytics over the next couple months and seeing if the current ways of dissemination is actually working. And if so, then yeah, we can continue. And the universities that um, I listed earlier that actually said they wanted to help, I would have been in contact with their presidents, their organizations. They asked a series of questions, but having that dialogue kind of already set up, I kind of figured it sets us in the future that once we get the data, I can talk to them again and say, hey, here's some updates, here's some, you know, kind of extra details for you. And kind of answer some questions and go along with, with seeing how it's going for them. Oh, great. Thank you, Zach. <laughs> and our next speaker is Danielle Meeker. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danielle Meeker, and today I am going to be presenting on the Capstone Project, a synthesis of climate adaptation planning needs in Alaska Native communities. So just to lend my project some context, there are 238 <coughs> federally recognized tribes in Alaska with over 20 native languages and distinct cultural regions, as shown on this map. However, one thing that is common to all tribes is traditional ecological knowledge, or TEK, and that is detailed environmental knowledge that has been cultivated and passed on through generations about things such as species migration habits or sustainable hunting practices. Like other Arctic communities, Alaska Native tribes are especially vulnerable to the impacts of climate change on subsistence availability and access, as well as threats to infrastructure from coastal erosion and permafrost. For my project, I worked for two months at the International Arctic Research Center at the University of Alaska Fairbanks under the direct guidance of Dr. Nathan Kettle, who is a co-investigator for the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment and Policy. My project was created by ACAP uh, in order to inform the Bureau of Indian Affairs Alaska Tribal Climate Science Liaison, who was recently hired in spring 2017 to serve as a go-between between tribes, agencies, and research institutions and to help build capacity and advance adaptation efforts in Alaska Native communities. For my project, I conducted a literature review and content analysis that are related to tribal climate adaptation planning in Alaska. Um, this included 39 documents, and I looked specifically at existing adaptation plans, workshop proceedings, institution reports, and climate impact assessments. Through my research, I also um, identified many events which did not produce any documents, such as trainings and workshops, but I did compile them into a table and make use of them um, in my research. My deliverable for this project was a report for the Tribal Climate Science Liaison Asia Steering Committee, and I did disseminate my results through presentations to IARC researchers and tribal representatives. Also, my final report will be posted on the ACAP website. 
My literature review and content analysis was guided by five questions. What is the current <laughs> level of tribal climate adaptation planning in Alaska? What are the barriers to that planning? How is climate science used in tribal planning? As well as how are traditional ecological knowledge and local observations used? And what are the climate science needs that remain for this tribal climate adaptation planning? To conduct my literature review, I first performed an extensive web-based search for documented keywords um, designed to find gray literature related to tribal climate adaptation planning. Um, and then I found additional documents through the references in those original sources. Once I had compiled a list of documents, I then sent that out to subject matter experts who verified it for completeness and suggested a few additional documents that were included in the analysis. I then used in vivo content analysis software to manually categorize or code sections of the literature that related to my research questions, as well as additional recurring themes that popped up over the course of the review. My review was guided by a coding dictionary, which are defined categories called nodes, such as climate science needs or barriers to adaptation, and subcategories, such as limited financial resources or a need for public outreach. For my first question, what is the extent of tribal climate adaptation planning? The review identified two completed plans for Alaska Native communities, the Norton Bay Watershed Climate Adaptation and Action Plan and the Chef Hewitt Climate Change Adaptation Plan. In addition, the review also identified four, four adaptation planning projects that are in various phases, but all have the ultimate goal of producing a climate adaptation plan. These are ongoing in the Nome Eskimo community, the Chugach region, which includes four tribes, Southeast Alaska, covering 17 tribes, and the traditional village of Oscarville. All of these ongoing projects were funded by grants from the Bureau of Indian Affairs Tribal Climate Resilience Program, which provided 12 grants over the past three fiscal years. However, these six plans, though completed in progress, do not show the full extent of adaptation planning within these communities and the preliminary steps that these tribes are taking to implement adaptation planning efforts. For that reason, this review also considered 31 um, adaptation planning related trainings, 31 workshops, and 15 climate impact assessments covering 25 native villages. So I designed um, this map here to serve as a landscape of completed adaptation efforts. The yellow dots that cover the state are the climate impact assessments, which can be considered as sort of a first step of adaptation planning. Um, these light red areas are adaptation plans in progress, which will cover most of the southeast. The um, filled in red are completed adaptation plans. And then you can see that the trainings, the green dots, are mostly concentrated in the larger cities of Fairbanks and Anchorage, as well as other Pacific Northwest states, such as Washington and Oregon. But that workshops are actually being held in these hub communities uh, around the state. For example, Coptic View in the Northwest has five workshops. And that's kind of been serving as the, the gateway to the Northwest Arctic portion of Alaska. For my next question, what are the barriers to tribal climate adaptation planning? The most frequently identified barrier found in 23 of the 39 documents was insufficient funding. And there are really three aspects to this. Within communities themselves, there are competing priorities for limited funds. That is to say that if a community also has substandard housing or limited educational opportunities, they might choose to allocate their funds towards that instead of climate adaptation, especially if they do not perceive climate change as an immediate threat. The next aspect is, refers to the shortcomings of cost-benefit analyses. This is in reference to communities that are threatened by coastal erosion and seek to implement massive infrastructure improvements or to relocate. These efforts usually only benefit a small population at very high cost due to their remote location, um, making them subject to fail cost-benefit analyses that are required by state and federal agencies. However, these analyses also don't account for non-monetary values such as the preservation of culture. And last, a uh, frequent financial barrier was what was called the stovepipe approach to funding. And that refers to how communities can have multiple awards from multiple different agencies from the Department of Energy to FEMA to the Bureau of Indian Affairs. And the argument there is that this doesn't allow for a comprehensive view of community needs that is needed to really implement these adaptation strategies. Additional um, frequently mentioned barriers, but there were a lot, include inflexible, outdated policy that doesn't account for climate change. This was most frequently mentioned in reference to natural resource management and hunting regulations, which are not changing to keep up with climate change and are forcing subsistence harvesters to choose between providing for their community or breaking the law. 
Another barrier would be lack of agency or framework um, for those coastal communities that seek to relocate. Currently, there's um, no agency overseeing that, and other emergency response agencies such as FEMA and the Army Corps of Engineers are ill-equipped to handle the needs of the, those communities. Another barrier that was expressed in many different ways is just insufficient interagency coordination, which results in less provision of resources for these communities. So the next question, how is climate science used in tribal climate adaptation planning? Looking specifically at the two plans that were completed already, um, both made use of peer-reviewed studies, as well as temperature and precipitation projections, um, satellite data, maps. Um, however, both, both plans like, cite a lack of downscaled, usable data. Um, Chef Tulip made use of a 2011 Army Corps of Engineers flooding analysis that was never meant to be used for planning decisions, and Norton Bay Watershed used statewide data instead of regionally specific data because there was none. How are traditional ecological knowledge and local observations used in tribal climate adaptation planning? When Shek Tulik, it is not specifically mentioned in the plan, um, but the planning process did include local input through community meetings and tribal representation on the planning committee. The Norton Bay Watershed Plan is a little different and it included three years for gathering traditional ecological knowledge uh, from 2014 to 2017 and allows for the plan to be updated later this year with additional traditional ecological knowledge. However, one thing that came through in many of the documents is that um, TEK, traditional proprietary information that should be protected by intellectual property rights and if possible, not publicly dis dis um, disclosed. For that reason, it is possible that this literature review might not reveal the full extent of the usage of TEK and adaptation planning. For the climate science needs related to tribal climate adaptation planning, um, it's very apparent that tribes often, often request data that relates to the impact of climate change on community lifestyle and health. Rather than just data on precipitation itself, they want to know how precipitation is going to affect their hunting patterns or their infrastructure. Um, these climate science needs can be broadly classified in these four categories. Threats to infrastructure, including permafrost thaw, flooding, and snow cover. Coastal changes from erosion, storm surge, sea level rise, and changes in sea ice. Subsistence availability and access, such as species distribution, phenology, and the weather, which determines whether or not hunters will be able to actually get out and hunt. And changes in the near shore environment, from changes in water temperature, currents, waterborne contaminants, or and ocean acidification. However, through the literature, there's a strong need for information and tools other than those conventional um, data products of, of trends and projections. Specifically, there is a strong demand for site-specific, user-friendly data. Um, two specific <coughs> recommendations were for more community-based monitoring, which can be used to create baseline data where there currently is none, and allow tribes to document climate change impacts in their community and build a case as they apply for state or federal funding. This also increases community participation and education. Some um, topics that were listed as, as potentially good topics for community-based monitoring include erosion, water quality, ice extent, soil temperature, and monitor monitoring of subsistence species. Another strong need that came through in the review was that of, for a data sharing mechanism or clearinghouse needed to coordinate all of the different um, research efforts ongoing in Alaska Native communities to provide some standardization and to reduce fatigue in communities that are constantly being asked to participate in research. One idea that certainly wasn't unanimous but came through in the literature was that we don't need more data. We need to be able to use the data that exists. The amount of data of, for fish, for example, in any one community is overwhelming. So again, it goes back to having downscaled data and the right usable data that can be used to inform planning decisions. Um, it, the literature also included quite a few recommendations for future planning and how to make it more effective and better meet community needs. Really at the heart of this was improving researcher tribe relationships, building trust and, um, and trust in relations where in the past, historically, traditional ecological knowledge has been excluded from Western science and there's been a, a barrier there. So there's a need to encourage two-way communication and parity between researchers and tribal representatives. Um, there's also a need to receive community consent and input at every step of the way. Several regions and boroughs have already created their own researcher protocols to which researchers must agree before they conduct research, um, which require this community consent. And there's also a need to ensure delivery of appropriate usable data back to the communities so that 
researchers aren't just conducting research and taking it out. There's also a need to increase the utility of science, not just to tribes, but to policymakers. Um, I've heard from both sides that staffs of reports are not useful, especially if the quickly of effort. Um, there, as I said, there's a need for a data sharing mechanism. And one, one report suggested that each community have a database or reference list of all of the plans or research that has been conducted with their community, because some communities don't even know what's out there. And there's a suggestion that this might be a time-consuming effort, but that it would be quite worth it in the long run. So how could my findings be incorporated into future research? Well, one of the remaining questions that I have are what are the existing networks? Where is there that trust? And where are the partnerships that can be built upon in the future? One idea would be to map agency, institution, nonprofit, and private efforts to identify networks and see who has worked together in the past. This would benefit from interviews, surveys, and feedback from stakeholders, including tribes and those who have worked on these projects. There's currently a very similar project underway um, in the, the Lieutenant Governor's Office in preparation for creating a sort of climate change strategy. Fortunately, I will be joining this project in July 2017 um, to work on their product of creating maps showing past partnerships. There's also a need to understand the best way to coordinate um, agency efforts. Where can agencies collaborate in order to provide these resources to tribes and to ease some of the burden of paperwork on tribes that are trying to seek funding and resources? There's a need to examine agency resources and determine where they can coordinate, or as suggested in some literature, if there's a need for an independent interdisciplinary entity. Such an interagency collaboration is currently away, just started, um, in support of the Adapt Alaska website, which is being developed by Alaska Sea Grant. This website, once created, is meant to be a web portal and a one-stop shop for those looking for adaptation information in Alaska, including grants, um, grant applications, and climate science data. And my, either my report or my map will be posted on this website to inform future efforts. So I'd like to say thank you to my Capital Advisory Committee, including Dr. John Gray, and um, some of the tribal representatives that helped review my report, um, as well as the Alaska Center for Climate Assessment Policy and Scripts, which funds my project. And any questions? Tribes need to know is where do we live? I'm melting under us with the, the sea level coming up, and how do we eat? We, they're animals, or they're fish, yeah. and so on. And as suggested before, a lot of these tribes have been doing this successfully for about 10,000 years. Mm -hmm. Now, I was astounded to hear that this is proprietary information that's not available. Traditional knowledge is, and that it, the more you think about it, it makes sense that tribes don't. If, if a researcher wants to know how walrus populations are changing, tribes don't necessarily want to give away where they go hunting for walruses, knowing that that might end up in a report somewhere. And then some of it is also of a more spiritual and religious importance. Um, but when we did talk about this before, certainly Arctic communities have a very high natural adaptive capacity that has allowed them to thrive in these harsh conditions. But what is a problem now with climate change is where policy hinders that adaptive capacity and where policy isn't, isn't coming up to speed and reflecting climate change, especially in conservative Alaska. And um, also, there, there will always be a need for more funding and more, more resources. In, in a more recent class, we were talking about how we can't talk about giving, giving tribes more resources when most of them, many villages still lack basic internet. So how are they going to know what's out there? Just one other question. Have you checked with the Canadians at all what they're doing with they, their tribes? They have a, a wealth. Peer reviewed and um, resources. Currently, from the little bit that I can comment on in the governor's office, they are at the point right now where they are trying to get the scene and figure out what is going on, who's doing it best, who can we learn from, and where is there potential for collaboration. Yeah. Um, so we touched on this in the grants, but I think the literature that is talking about the barriers of funding, do they identify any? Um, it's it's very patched. So the the BIA is really the greatest uh, federal source, and then for <laughs> governance in Alaska, it's kind of a big thing in itself. But there's usually this village or the city government. Then there's a regional corporation. Then there's a regional nonprofit. Um, then there is the state government, and then there's federal. So the native nonprofits um, often funded a lot of these trainings and workshops and 
they they're used to it. So they know to seek out um, research partnerships, but there is a lot of confusion about which agencies can provide funding for what and how can it best be used. Their reason that um, most of the adaptation plans that are in progress are concentrated in the Southeast region. Um, they both just cover a large area. So the um, Chugan, there are actually only four, four or five tribes involved in this. In the Southeast region, that's 17, but that is being spearheaded by the Central Council of Tlingit Haida. And Tlingit Haida has already formed a lot of partnerships because they do a lot of ocean acidification research um, out of Sitka. They have many of their own little research organizations there studying how ocean acidification is affecting commercial fisheries. So, um, and they're working quite closely with the Alaska Sea Grant. So I think that's where they're getting a lot of funding to do these preliminary workshops that will eventually be used to make quite a large impact. Any other questions for Danielle? Okay. Thank you. Okay, and our next speaker is Moon Lim. Hello. I know you guys might be quite exhausted, but this is the final presentation before the break. So my name is Moon Lim, and today I will talk about my project, the goal of which was to use visualizations of satellites and aircraft taken radar products to detect the Alisa Canyon natural gas. So this is the outline for my talk. First, I'll give a brief overview of the global well climate change and its relevance to California state policy and show some visualizations I made and delve into some specific conclusions. So why do we care about methane in the first place? So globally, reduction of methane may be necessary to keep the warming under two degrees Celsius threshold. And global methane concentrations have increased by 2.5 compared to 1750 levels. And methane is a very potent greenhouse gas and is the second most prevalent after carbon dioxide. It also has secondary climate and air quality impacts as a precursor to ozone. So in California, <coughs> the total state greenhouse gas emissions have decreased. The total inventory methane emissions have increased from 2002 to 2014. And nine, uh, total, uh, it's, uh, methane is 9% of total greenhouse gases inventory, but it's a number that is uh, underestimated as scientific research have found. So there's a known discrepancy between inventory methane data, how much methane we think there are, versus the atmospheric measurements of methane. And some studies have found that this about 50%, depending on your region, could be due to of fossil origin. So, and this is a, uh, the, that gap between inventory methane and atmospheric methane. It's a known fact in the end, it's a state concern. And California Air Resources Board is the agency that cares most about this right now. And so the, this is the agency that through legislation has the responsibility to track and reduce greenhouse gases. And so what does that mean? That means turning this noble goal of reducing methane 40% below 2013 levels by 2030 into specific targeted strategy and realistic action. And the two that are, is particularly relevant to my project is that there's a um, identified urgent need to monitor and measure high emission methane hotspots and also to understand better methane leaks from natural gas infrastructure. And the reason we care about methane hotspots is that methane is, uh, the distribution of methane emissions is known to be fat fill. So that means uh, that there are few sources of emissions that contribute high fraction to the total amount, but it would make sense for the state to focus on those high emitters. So the goal of my project was to evaluate different methane data products with their potential to detect methane hotspots in California. Specifically, I used a gas leak as an example of a hotspot and tried to answer this research question. Can satellite and aircraft methane data products be used to detect the gas leaks and their sources? And as a secondary goal of the project was to use visualization of scientific data products as a communications tool. So I picked the Aliso Canyon natural gas leak as a test case for my project. And so why did I pick this test case? It was the largest documented gas leak in the United States. And during the duration of the leak, it contributed, it contributed to the one-fifth of the total state greenhouse gas emissions. And it was a huge public disaster that led to evacuation of houses and schools. It was a public health concern because natural gas, although it's about 95% methane, it has
has trace amounts of toxic chemicals such as benzene. And the quant total quantified leak amount was 100 k megatons equivalent of CO2. And another factor about this uh, uh, gas leak was that it really put to test a lot of the research data products into the talk test. So these are the four data sources that I used. Today, I'll be only talking about three of them. The first one I'll be talking about is a satellite data uh, based on GOSA, greenhouse gases observing satellite. And just briefly, it was developed by these agencies, including Japan Aerospace Explosion Agency. And it's the world's first satellite that is designed specifically to detect greenhouse gases, including carbon dioxide and methane. And so why did I choose GOSA? I chose it because it had high uh, temporal resolution of three-day revisit time, which means it visits the same spot on Earth that it measures every three days. And it also had data available for the leakage monsters. So specifically, I used the level three process data, which was monthly average of methane carbon mixing ratio. And I first I made maps of on California with the methane concentration concentration overlay. And what I did first was I made maps for the duration of the leak from October 2015 when the leak started, and or when the leak was spotted to March 2016, one month after the plugging of the leak. And then to see if that October of the leak had any anomaly, I plotted all the Octobers from 2009 to 2016 and some Februarys as well. So this is an example of a map I made for the duration of the leak. So that's here, it's the October 2015 when the leak was detected and the blue star is the roughly the location of the isochemic oil field. And so in these visuals, the dots represent methane concentration and they're just made bigger for readability. They're about, they're 2.5 by 2.5 degrees part in light from the launch tube. And the, the range is from 1.72 PMD to 1.84, but you can see that it's around, it starts around, I think, 1.81 to 1.84, so which is pretty high, but it's the resolutions, both temporally and spatially, aren't really good enough to say if this location had any specific anomaly. So next, this is an example of a uh, map that I made for all the Octobers. Here as well, there's a, it's nice that the, it shows an increasing trend, but it's hard to anything specific about October 2013. <coughs> so it's hard to tell whether this is an anomaly year. So because the maps weren't really viable for detecting the anomaly, I plotted some time series. And first I made some uh, time series based on global annual mean and also global annual anomalies. And I chose a point closest to the Elizabeth Canyon gas leak to count the annual mean and also annual anomalies that had global trends filtered out. So this is an example of a time series I made. Uh, this is for the global. And what's so here so the dots are in concentration, it goes from about 1.76 PMD to 1.81, which is about 0 0.05 increase. And I think what this visual shows is, is that it builds confidence that the satellite is working at a at a global scale because it is known that methane is increasing, so it shows that GOSAT may be doing something right. And so this is for one specific location nearest to the Alisa Canyon oil field. And it also shows increase from 1.78 to 1.82. It's a little higher than the global average, but we don't know, let's see, does that show an anomaly? It's kind of hard to tell. So then I plotted a, um, another plot that filtered out the global trend and to see if this showed an anomaly for between 2015 and 2016. So this is the 2016 year. It seems like it could potentially be an anomaly. And if you do a line like here, it's a, and if you assume that was the average, potentially it could be an anomaly. So maybe it could be reading somewhere. And I have some specific plans to do follow-up analysis and statistically quantify if it's an anomaly. But that's in, that I'll mention in the future research section. So in conclusion, go set maps and time series, what is it useful for? I think it was useful for tracking global, uh, long term global changes in methane level and also for long term regional changes in methane level. And it may potentially be useful for detecting hot spot type anomalies, but it requires further analysis. And what is it not useful for? I found that it's not useful for detecting hot spots to the point source level. So that motivates the discussion of my next set of data products. So these are two data products. Um, so one is hyperspectral thermal energy spectrometer. That has a methane measurement, and then another is Vista, or it's your special information system maps that has, which is a map of methane emitting infrastructure in California. And these two data products are both developed at NASA JPL, and I chose to use them because 
one of my uh, expert advisor friends, Dr. Francesca Hopkins, had a quadrate on both data products. So these are really cool products, but I'm not going to talk in detail about this. I put some more information in the appendix. But very briefly, so um, high test the name of the airborne spectrometer, it is really high spectral and spatial resolution, which is really good for detecting trace gases. And I specifically use methane plume images from six different flights from January 2016. So that's the duration of the night. And far from Vista, I chose specifically one layer, which is a map of oil and gas well locations. And the reason I chose that layer is because it is known that the gases originated from a specific well, well 25 in the oil field. And so I use these data products to create Google Earth overlays of methane plume images over the top of the map of oil and gas wells for the Aliso Canyon oil field. So this is an example of a map. And in this visual, so the green pixels indicate methane presence above a certain threshold. And it is actually a, so it is a color match filter output. So it's a unitless quantity that represents methane concentration. But from this, it leads to the rough algorithm to derive actual concentration. And the gray background is the general temperature of the background. And I've highlighted in that icon the location of the deep origin, well number 25, to give a little bit more context. So the purple dots in this one, this is a visual from another day. The purple dots are the locations of the wells. And so what's really, um, what can be seen here is that even if you cannot use the data sources to detect it, to, to specifically say, well 25 was where the leak happened, you can see how these tools can really help you constrain that it probably occurred from one of those five or four wells, and which saves a lot of money and time when you're trying to detect the leak. And the wind is also in this case blowing roughly in the direction of factor, so it builds, shows how the methane plume is spreading in that direction. Just to give a little bit more context, so this is the location of the Elysian Canyon oil field, and in the downstream where there is, there are people living here in the Porter Ranch area just to uh, provide a little bit more context of where that was. So in conclusion, I think methane plume images so used together with Vista maps, it can identify gas leaks to the point source level, and it's a very, very promising tool for methane hotspot detection. And it can, as I mentioned earlier, it can rapidly constrain areas for follow-up measurements that are more quantitatively uh, intensive. And so what is it not useful for, for yet is that you do need to use retrieval algorithms to actually divide uh, to derive surface methane concentration. So I think a lot would depend on the robustness of the algorithm. So in conclusion, so what I did was I created visualizations of methane research data products to detect a specific gas leak. And some of the findings I had at is that post test satellite data, it was good for showing average levels of methane in the global and digital atmosphere. And I think it has a potential to be used to monitor long-term methane reductions progress for the California Air Research Board that's interested in reducing methane in the, short, in the long run. And the NASA two NASA data products are effective in determining, identifying leakage to the hotspot level. So I have some specific recommendations for the California Air Research Board, and these include, I think it will be important to build the infrastructure to use, to use the satellite data to detect hotspots. And I say this because based on my research, there's, there are upcoming satellites that has really high temporal and spatial resolution. And I think satellite data could potentially play a role by raising red flags when the methane levels become anomalous. And also right now it is currently used in tandem with other higher spatial resolution data such as airborne and ground measurements. And I think that really increases the value of satellite data. And the next set of recommendation I have is to so there are some existing ongoing collaboration with NASA JPL, and I think it will be really valuable for the California Air Research Board to collaborate and start using the existing high test and ESTA data when they're making targeted strategy plans for methane mitigation. So finally, I think I hope like through my presentation, I was able to show a little bit about, I think, using visualizations to com communicate complex methane data. And there's a quote that says, the purpose of computing is insight, not numbers. In some ways, it's, this, is a, this doesn't really apply strictly to methane, because with methane, methane emissions actually, knowing how much is emitted and how much you need to mitigate that matters. But I think it captures the fact that good visualization hopefully can portray stories about methane. So some future work and examination plans, so more specifically, I have a follow-up analysis.
analysis idea is to filter out seasonality from both sex answers because methane is known to uh, have seasonality and to look at monthly data instead of the yearly average and also to try to determine the closest significance of the anomaly. And I also created a um, prototype website where I put some of my visualization and where I'll be putting the rest of my visualizations as well. And as part of the dissemination plan, I have identified some contacts at the California Air Resource Board from different divisions. And I'll be sending them one page short, one page summary before engaging their um, further interests. So finally, I would like to thank um, everybody in my cast and advisor committee, Dr. Francesca Hopkins, who's joining us remotely today, and Dr. Ralph Killing, who's here today as well, and Dr. Scott Sellers, who's also here, and Dr. Ali Farai, who's joining us remotely as well, and Dr. Lynn Russell here, who's here today. And I would also like to extend my thank yous to our CSP court for the and Dr. P back and support, as well as uh, my friends at E and Via for their help with like Python related things, as well as being really the inspiration for this year, and Andre as well. Cool. Thank you so much. So the train, there's a the JPL, they are working on an algorithm right now and they've tested on certain cases, but it's still in development. So it's not, yeah, oh, yeah it's, it's still in development. Okay, so they're still kind of developed and they haven't yeah. been able to be able to tell you what concentrations that could be showing. Is that what it is? Yeah, like with statistical uncertainty. Okay. Thank you. Is that more complicated? Oh. So, oh, oh, thanks for asking your question. But I didn't, I, I didn't specifically choose that threshold. But there is a certain threshold, and I could not hunt down the exact threshold. But basically, so I can, oh, oops, oh, so I can show you. So it's so high, so hyperspectral thermal emission spectrometer. So it's spectrometer data that measures um, thermal radiation. So it basically, so to get that in a short way, so the output of this. Is so it measures thermal radiation and different gases have kind of their own spectral signature, which means how well they absorb certain wavelengths. And you use that spectral signature in addition to the data you acquire from buying this airborne spectrometer to, ident to identify the gases. But it's a pretty complicated process. There's, yeah. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I don't think I answered your question, but they do use a threshold, but in short, it's apparently it's a case by case dependent, and I've been trying to kind of learn a little bit more about it. Um, so, you mentioned the seasonal cycle of methane. Can you say what that cycle is or what causes it? Ah, so that's, that's a, not a bad question. Very, very good question. I was trying to read more up on it a little bit. So, I don't, so I read that it actually it does depend on, so I don't. So to be upfront, I don't know it for with confidence at all. But very brief research, I heard that it does depend on temperature, but then temperature and precipitation. But I, when I was looking it up, the and when I was analyzing, so February wasn't actually one of the high months, and October was, I think, yeah. But I don't know with confidence. And one of my professor had the um, guess that she wondered if it had anything to do with permafrost thawing. And that I was actually trying to ask one of my advisors. So <laughs> it's it's high in February and low in what is the when is it higher and when is it lower? Even oh. if we don't know what causes it. I cannot I'll give okay. it straight answer, but it's not it's not high in February and okay. October is either high or low. Okay. I know that's a very big answer. Okay. Did it, I was going to let Francesca ask a question. Oh, okay. She has a question remotely. Um, what advice would you have for scientists to enhance their collaborations with the Air Resources Board? Okay, so the advice I would have is that they have some more, I think, ad hoc collaboration going on. But I personally think it would be really valuable if they make it more systematic so that the scientists can always incorporate best, most important policy concerns into their talks, and also the policymakers can be informed by the best available scientific knowledge. But I think 
making that more systematic and routine would be really valuable. Because it's something that if you, you know, catch up in a month, it's not, I think you need really ongoing interaction. That's probably my advice. Great. And answer. Thank you. Yeah. And now, now is the promise break. It's right outside of the blue table. And um, uh, be back here at 3 o'clock, and we'll start again. And um, where's the closest water fountain? Upstairs. Upstairs. Go up one flight and oh. <laughs> There's a well, water the cooler room. on the entrance yeah. upstairs. Oh, no, I took it away. I think you have to go down the hall. It's one floor up down the hall, and then there's water. Uh-huh. Should we leave it just running open?